Welcome to Voices of the Ancestors, where we explore Georgian polyphonic songs and the women who sing them. The voices today are me, Susan Thompson, and me, Holly Taylor Zuntz, and the Chemgeliani sisters, Madonna, Anna, and Eka, from the singing village of La Khushti in Svaneti in the Upper Caucasus, which is the highest mountainous region in Georgia. So they are real Svan women. And we'll be hearing a few of the surprise voices along the way. <laughs> Let's hear the sisters introduce themselves now, along with some impressions from storyteller Dawn Ellis, who you'll hear more from later. I find them to be the essence, between them, to be the essence of everything I thought would be Georgian. For example, Madonna, she really stands solid on the earth and she's got these flashing black eyes and a temperament to go with it. Anna has got that tenderness about her, the tender eyes, but um, a sort of very grounded musicality. And then you have Eka in the, in the kitchen, who just is hospitality incarnate. Any questions, dear? We've been wanting to interview these sisters for so long because they keep coming up in conversation in our other episodes. So we heard about the Svan ritual with chickens in our episode on folk instruments. And we've used music from the Singing Village album to illustrate Svan songs in several episodes now. So one of the reasons it's taken us a while to interview the sisters is because, well, firstly, they do come from quite a remote region, Plus, getting the three of them together in one place can be a challenge. And then getting you, Susan, and a translator (laughs) there is an added challenge on top. So when this opportunity came up, it was really great that you grabbed it with both hands. Yeah, it it was. It was amazing. I mean, um, the Maspinzelli choir that we sing with in London, that's Holly and I sing with Maspinzelli. Um, They had a trip into Georgia and uh, stayed for a whole week up in in La Cushti. Um, And... Zoe Perret was leading this trip, so it was just too good an opportunity. We had all three Chamgeliani sisters and a translator. It was great. Yeah, I think since 2019, the Chamgeliani sisters have been talking with Maspinzelli about a visit to the singing village. And after three years and a pandemic, this Mm -hmm. visit finally took place in June 2023 at the height of the spring flowers. And I couldn't make it, but Susan, you and about 20 others did. Yeah, that's right. And there was quite a few members in the choir who'd never been to Georgia before. So that was really exciting to be there with people for whom it was the first time. Yeah, and I loved what Annalie said, who... um, She's a professional musician and she's been singing Georgian songs for years. Um, But this was her first time in Georgia and you got to speak to her, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. And we'd been there. It was it was literally our last evening. And I just grabbed her and said, Annalie, you know, can we can we just do a recording now of your impressions (laughs) of your first week in Georgia? So here's one of the other voices in this episode. Annalie Wilson, also known as Luna Beck. And I hope you enjoy the very authentic village soundscape, including the horses in the background. It feels like, it does feel like a kind of coming home because I've, I've made a connection with these songs and I've deepened that connection with friends and in workshops and retreats and at supras and I feel like I became acquainted with the culture long before I visited the country. Mm -hmm. So actually coming here and seeing where it's, well, coming to the source and then experiencing it here, it does feel like a kind of completion of a circle and, and also just this thing of starting a song and then being able to connect with local people who can join in singing, even though I've only got a few words of Georgian, I have very, very simple sentences. Um, which all consist of gamma joba, rogo kar kad, um, uh, you know. But then, but then in song, yeah. we're completely 
connected and that's in a way in a weird way something I hadn't expected because I've I've known these songs and this culture just with people like me I hadn't yeah. known it with Georgian people so yeah. much yeah. And we're not the only singers with a connection to the Chamigelianes and the singing village of La Khushti. Yeah, people come from all over the world to visit them. They they set up this project in 2011 uh, with Madge Bray and Nanam Javanadze, who we heard from in episode 10. That's right. So Madonna told the story of how the singing village came about. She said years ago there was a feast day and the only people that she saw singing and dancing were the old men. And she realised that if the younger generation wasn't involved in the feast... She just couldn't imagine living there anymore. It felt to her like she would just, I don't know, she would just be staying in the landscape, but nothing more, sort of no depth. Um, and she said this this was why it was really important to her that our group, Maspinzelli, came. <laughs> Although she sort of laughed and said, well, when they were there learning, they didn't have any teachers themselves. As children, they just loved the songs in a natural way. They were raised in a singing environment. Um, they would just listen to the people who were singing around them and learnt like that. And she feels it's now a problem that many of the families in the village have completely lost the traditional singing. So when they were thinking about the project, this village of Lakushti, it seemed geographically just perfect felt like a really good place to conserve and preserve these songs because the village, it's a bit off the beaten track. It's not on the main road to to um, Mestia, which is the capital. Um, you have to turn off the main road in the village of Latali. Um, so it's perhaps a... She felt a really good environment to preserve these Venetian songs. And then Madonna acknowledged the fact that, you know, there are schools that are trying to preserve the songs in Mestia, but she just couldn't imagine that people from her village would go all the way to Mestia with their children to go and learn songs. It's too far. You know, 20 minute walk down the road and then catch a mashutka for perhaps another 15, 20 minutes or walk the whole way. So for Madonna, it felt really necessary to have singing learning in the village. So what you're hearing at the moment is a bit of a different audio style than our usual podcast episodes. So this interview was recorded on the last day of the trip in the newly built singing house and the sisters were most comfortable speaking in Georgian um, and our friend and tour guide Zoe Pere translated in the moment and if you heard our episode with Tamar Boadze you will know that Zoe's an awesome interpreter of Georgian but we're going to try something a bit different so you're going to hear us speaking the translations uh, with bits of the sisters speaking in Georgian alongside singing or playing as well and some reflections and and extra bits of audio as well Susan right? That's right and do you know Holly there were so many little snippets all the way through the week where the recording conditions just weren't great for, for podcasting but I just wanted to be able to, to share all these little things with everybody so I've tried to weave some of those things in like the trip to the museum and the, the storytelling around the fire in the village. Yeah, and I really liked one of the extra bits you recorded with Dawn Ellis, who was another first-timer in Georgia, and she's a storyteller, and she was speaking about the, the ballads. The ancestors' voices are where we get all our wisdom, our knowledge, our um, imagery. Um, just there, I think the ancestors are sort of speaking out of the land... Mm. and also speaking through the stories, but particularly here, they're speaking through the ballads. Mm. And I don't think I completely got, until I arrived, 
that they don't really have a story t- a storytelling tradition in the way mm-hmm. that we do in sort of Celtic or mm. a lot of other, you know, African, a lot of Af- mm-hmm. African societies. Most of it's done through song and through ballad, mm. uh, and probably always has been. Mm. Um, but the voices of the ancestors speak through, I think, speak through the culture that they're preserving. Um, they're always talking about their grandparents, their mothers, um, and they're very much alive still. I think they're very much alive still. But all the ballads are the voices of the ancestors. And I think when we've walked in the hills and walked in the mountains, I'm imagining feet that have trodden those paths before me and feet that have tilled those uh, very steep hill (laughs) fields. When I sat with uh, Madonna and Anna and Eka, the interview started with them singing a ballad to us. So we hope you enjoy this episode with the Chamgaliani sisters. It's been a long time in the making, so if you do enjoy the episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon or Ko-fi so that we can keep bringing you songs and stories from Georgia. And so now let's hear the ballad which was chosen to entertain their ancestors' spirits. Ask the sisters about the song that they'd started with, this ballad. Can you tell us about the song? It's a ballad. 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 It's a ballad
մինորուլի սինգերեպի կուր է բաճունիրիս թանխլեպիտ, դա ծոտա սևդիանի սինգերեպա, էխեպա ծնեպս, դա դետակրեպա մատ համբավուս. And it was curious, Madonna was saying that how the instrument that was being played, it's a tuneri, and most of the songs that are sung with a tuneri are quite sad, and they have a sort of minor note in them. Um, and in this particular song, it's a mother telling the story. Um, and that it's a very, very long ballad. And for this example, they'd shortened the text. <laughs> շիրատ վիսմենտի խորմ է ոջախշի լիպանալիս պերիոտ շի, ռոգոր մղերոտա մամի դատա մամա գրծել պալադեպսրով, ես խամ է դայթեն է բինատ կերխով, գայերթոտ սուլ է բի։ And then they went on to say a bit more about these very long ballads and how useful they were during one of the ritual times of the year in Svenetti um, called Lipanali. So Lipanali is in January. It starts on the 18th of January, and it's a very important holiday. Um, and for, for this family, at this time, they believe they are inviting the souls, the spirits of their family, the people who've passed away, and they invite them into the home, and they invite them to take part in feasts. Um, and And Madonna had said that she remembers her father and her aunt singing at Lipanali and she thought perhaps they chose to sing ballads because they were so long they would keep the ancestor spirits entertained for a good long while <laughs> And Madonna remembered that when her father welcomed these spirits, their ancestors, it was a bit strange for her because she couldn't see these people to whom he was speaking and she was even a bit scared. So then I wondered if it was different for Eka um, because she is the oldest sister. Um, there's quite a big gap between her and Madonna, and, and the uh, father would have been talking to people that, that she knew. And Eka said that she only knew her grandmother, but her memory was of really um, the excitement of waiting every year for this holiday, um, the excitement of preparing for the holiday and inviting those spirits in. At Mesti Museum, there was um, an exhibition to honour Dina Kozevnikova, who was working between 1905 and 1975. And the exhibition was called Myth and Reality, and it um, featured the photographs of Dina. Um, and I think Madonna had worked on this exhibition, putting it together when she was working at the National Museum of Georgia. And there was this photo, and it was so atmospheric. It was like... It was there was a sort of earthen floor and a hearth, and then two men carrying a big branch of a tree, and if you can imagine, sort of front and back, and then riding between them was a child about I don't know eight years old, something like that, and that the label said that there was a ritual of circling a wooden stick, a hula, around the hearth, um, and the photo was taken in the Latali community, and then. Madonna told us a bit more. She said what happens after the stick's been carried around the hearth in the circle is that the branch was kept until Lipanali in January and that's when it would be burnt. Now, the label did give us the name of this ritual, but I can't pronounce it for the life of me. B-E-M-B-G-H-U. And of course it would be in a Spanetian accent because I'm guessing it's a span word for a span ritual. Now, you know the Sfan ritual, the one with the cockerel and the changi and the chiniri? Oh, you mean the catching the souls ritual that Nino Razmadze was telling us about in the previous episode? Yeah, that's the one. 
Well, at this exhibition, the myth and reality one, there was actually a photo and it was labelled the ritual of separating soul from the body of the deceased. And Ma- oh, wow. <laughs> I know. And Madonna talked, you know, that sort of prompted her to, to talk a bit about it. And she said, oh, yeah, she said, you know, she remembers going to the local hospital when her aunt died to go and collect the soul of her aunt. Wow. And so did you get to hear any more about the Tbilisi hospital story? Oh, yeah. Yes, I did. So it turned out, Madonna said there was a, a woman in the village who, who'd got a relative who had died in a Tbilisi hospital. And she, it was really important to her that the soul should come back to Svaneti. So Madonna got this message and was asked if she would go and collect it um, with the rest of the family. So I think I think it was just Anna and Madonna who went. Um, with a cockerel, obviously. So, and poor Anna got the job of carrying the cockerel. Quite how that was, I don't know, because apparently she's really scared of cockerels. So, anyway, so, <laughs> so I have this vision of of Anna, you know, gripping the wings of a cockerel under her arm very tightly, probably with Madonna carrying the changi, and I guess a chineri as well. Um, and off they go into this hospital in Tbilisi. Um, and I think they've been given the, the ward where this person had died because that's where you have to go and collect the soul from. Um, and as far as I could tell, they weren't stopped by anybody. Um, you know, in, in <laughs> they went and up the stairs. Um, and, and, and I think the cockerel was quite calm during this period. But when they got to where the actual ward was and they pushed open these double doors, the cockerel went berserk. It was crowing, it was trying to flap, it was just, you know, really going wild. Um, so poor Anna. Oh my God. I know. And, and then the other people on the ward, because I guess they must have been singing and playing by this stage as well, because that's part of the ritual. <laughs> and, and the other people on the ward apparently were looking a bit bemused and possibly a bit scared. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I can understand yeah, that. I don't think it's such a normal occurrence in Tbilisi. Um, no, no. But- Probably a bit more unusual than in Mestia. Well, well, quite. But, you know, Madonna said, you know, in Mestia, the cockerel, it reacts when the soul enters it, but not like this. She said, I don't think we were collecting one soul. She said, I don't know how many (gasps) Spinettium souls we caught. Oh, wow. (laughs) They were trapped in the Tbilisi hospital waiting to be brought home. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, so that was the story. And then I asked a bit about, so what happens to the cockerel? And she sort of said, well, you know, it goes back, went back to Svaneti. And then the cockerel, for 40 days, people treat the cockerel as a person because, the, you know, like the, the 40 days after someone's buried. So, yeah. <laughs> so how do they treat the cockerel as a person? Like, does it sit at the table? Do they talk I to d- it? I didn't get any more detail. Sorry. it was. Just, I, was <laughs> I think I was so stunned by this whole thing. I was just like... Tell I have to so, have so many questions about <laughs> oh, me this. Me too. Me too. Perhaps we'll have to go back up there with Nino Razmadze sometime and, <laughs> yeah. and get as much detail as possible. So I've heard of this song called Barbal Dolash, but I don't think it originally came from the Chamgeliani sisters. Did you find out about that song when you were there? Did you sing it? Yeah, I got to know a bit. When I think it was Madonna was explaining about um, that Barbal is a place and a church, that it seemed like churches in Svaneti have characters. So... I kind of understood this to be like, I don't know, the church in my village is a St. Mary's. So, you know, you'll celebrate St. Mary's Saints Day. But in Smetty, it seemed to be more than that. It was like, yes, the church has a saint and it has a Saints Day and a feast day. But also each church had a set of characteristics like, oh, the obvious one might be one's very good for fertility. Um, But things things like that. So it was like the the Barbal is a place and it's a church and it's a almost like a being, a character. Oh, wow. OK. And where did they learn this song from? Has it been in their family? Yeah, yeah. well, it kind of, it seems to be from the area. So so the place Barbar with this church is nearby. So that's nearby Lakushti, which is nearby Latali. 
So it's in that area of Spinetti. Um, and we were taught by Murad and Givi, and they both knew um, Barbal Dolash. Well, the, I say they knew it. They knew the first part. Okay. Then Anna explained, because Anna sings with Satanao, and the leader of Satanao is Tatiana Megralidze. That's the women's ensemble that sing in Tbilisi? Yeah, yeah, they're based in Tbilisi, yes. And they've toured in the UK. And I think that was probably when I first met Anna. But Anna said Tatia gave her a ring one time and said, I've been I've been looking through, you know, been researching and I found this score in this book that seems to be Bab al Dolash. Do you want to come and have a look? You know, I'd like you to come and have a look and work together. So I think that was her, she recognised it as being something from Svanetti. Um, so Anna came and looked and they looked at it and Anna sort of said when she first saw it she really didn't find it very interesting. She wasn't thought, didn't really, wasn't really sure about it. But she said after they'd, she realised, I think at some point it dawned on her that it was a, a, a round dance, a pakuli. Um And they, she and Tasia just tweaked some of the structure of it or the, the notes in it. <laughs> And and then they put it as a second part of Barbal Dolash. And I think that's quite normal that you get, you know, a static part of a song and then and then it moves into a dance part of a song. I think you and I have come across that before in other in other pieces. Um so as a structure it seemed to I could see why they thought that was the way to go. Okay, and so what did the elders in the village think when they heard the second half of the song? Well, that was just so funny because it was like, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd walk up the stairs as, as, the, as the main group would be rehearsing the second bit and the dance and people would be going, come and join in, join in. And they're going, we don't know it. We can't, we can't do that. <laughs> it's like, no, we, we can't do this dance. And they'd sort of be, be pulled in and then peel out again because it was new to them. But they, it, they seemed OK with it. It wasn't, you know, they weren't, they didn't react with sort of anger or crossness. It was a sort of slightly bemused curiosity, really. <laughs> Mati Uganda Brune, but it only Opashita so perishi. Tamshin to Pomashi are Anna Certetic Zag, Oroic Nebu, Tava Brunot, I'm so perishi, S. Sars, Middle Arts Murad Dimarski, and Nebrivia. Wow, that's so cool how even these old uh, tradition holders and song holders are learning new parts of songs from from their own region but they're coming from a book in Tbilisi exactly and it was really fresh because Anna said that Satanao had only just performed it like last week the week before she'd come up here so there was a point at which I asked whether she and her sisters could sing it for me and they looked at each other and went no only Anna knows it and it was like uh, but it seemed to Anna that it was important to her that this that she was able to pass it on and bring it back to to Lakushti. Great. <laughs>
the first part of the song Barabal Dolash, sung by the sisters and Levan Bitarovi. Now let's return to hear a bit more from Anneli. I, it's my first time staying with a singing family. I feel very lucky that it's been such a, a, a female-led situation. Like mm. I think we've got this three sisters with these different qualities and mm. it, it feels very powerful and um and it's yeah it's it's been it's been really enriching to have different threads from each one of them mm. to hear a lot from Madonna about the background of the songs and what she's been doing with her revolutionary activities <laughs> um which is very exciting for me and something i felt like really I connected with her about and then from Anna I feel we've got more of the sort of the the more mystical depth of the music and, mm. and the way that she puts the songs across it's been really nice for me as a as a woman singer to have the songs that taught to me in my own pitch yes because so often I think I tend to sort of try and imitate these um, male singers mm -hmm. Um, because I sort of can, to some degree, get that sound, but at, at a cost, you know. Mm. And it's, it's sometimes it's it's good for me to to hear it, you mm. know, in a in a range that I can relate to, and also in a slightly different style, you know, it's different. Yeah. So, um, so that's been really nice, and but that's you know that's one part of it. I think the they're obviously. They're so steeped in this music. I think some of my favourite moments were being in the kitchen and somebody's cooking, somebody's chatting, Anna picks up the chonguri and starts singing and playing and then Madonna walks over and starts singing and maybe Levin then arrives yeah. and, and suddenly... And it's so relaxed. It's so, mm -hmm. it's so part of the fabric and you can feel that it, this, is, this is how the family has been and you're, you're a guest yeah. in this family. Yeah. That's what it feels yeah. like. That's more, more precious to me in a way or more an embodied experience than any workshop I've done. Yes. Because I'm, I'm just, I feel like I'm living how the songs have been yeah. sung and passed down yeah. through generations and that's definitely that's coming through them without them even trying but then also I feel there's this there's this real um, passion in them to share it as yeah. well yeah. and then there are moments where I feel like they've really shared why that's important to them it's yeah. very clear to me now yeah. that I'm not just coming here and like taking it um, without giving anything in return, that there's something of an exchange, yeah. which is really important to me. That yeah. that they are also feeling appreciative yeah. that we want to learn this yeah. music and yeah. sing it. So. And my final question is going to be: yes. the podcast is called Voices of the Ancestors. And what does that mean to you? That phrase. I thought a lot about ancestors, and I, I have. For the last few years, I've got a practice of calling on ancestors before I do any kind of performance. And I, I don't think of ancestors simply as the people that were responsible for my DNA. Mm -hmm. I think of my ancestors and I do regularly call on 
people that have inspired me or people mm. who I feel I need in the room with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I th I'm quite free with, with the mm. idea of ancestors mm. and I, I feel that coming here, being here, soaking up the music and, and learning from the Changalianis and the other teachers that we've had, that's, that we are experiencing the voices of the ancestors and then channeling them and then re-singing them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, in a way, the ancestors because we're taking that in and then we are going to be the ancestors for the next yeah. generations of people. And I think, yeah, I think that's what it means to me. It's, it's an energy, it's a, it's a resource, it's something that's available to us to tap into if we... If we want to, I feel like the ancestors are there. They're just sitting there waiting for our interest. Yes. That's, mm. in a way, like that, that, maybe that way of thinking comes a little bit from my, my Buddhist past, this idea mm. that the, um, like in Tibetan Buddhism, you have this idea of the dralas or, you know, energies that are just, they're just waiting for you mm. to pay attention. Mm. That's what it feels like. Mm. And, and by doing this podcast, you're, you're doing exactly that. You're paying attention. Mm. And so that's why it's, it's flowing because yeah. the stuff wants to be unearthed, doesn't yeah. it? And, yeah. And shared. Yes. It's really heartwarming to hear Annalie's appreciation and acknowledgement of this work that Susan and I are doing on the podcast. And I love the idea that, yeah, these ancestors and these stories and these songs are just waiting, aching to be heard and, and shared across the world. Um, so it's a real privilege to do this work. And if you're feeling appreciative of this podcast, if it brings something good into your life, it's really easy to support us to just keep unearthing and, and sharing more and more uh, stories from Georgia so you could go to Ko-fi or Patreon and support us financially and we'll put the links in the show notes. One way that we want to share more stories is by getting some new equipment so that we can go to remote places and record several people at once. So yeah, your money is, is going to help us unearth more stories. A really simple thing you can do is tell your friends about this podcast, share us on social media and just help us get more listeners. We are completely independent. This podcast is literally just me and Susan making this thing together. So every individual donation is seen by us and felt by us and really appreciated. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Now, Holly, when you went to Mestia Museum, did you see those large stones, the ones with holes in the middle that were kind of strung together on a piece of string? No, I didn't. Please tell me more. <laughs> OK. Well, I only know more because Madonna was going round with us and was giving us a lot more background information to the exhibits. So we nicknamed these stones Sin Stones. Gosh, that's hard to say. Um, and she said they were worn by people, so like a, a, over the shoulder and under the armpit, as we understood it, I think under clothes even. They were quite big and heavy, um, but they had to be worn by people if they'd killed another person, but not like an intentional murder. It was only if you'd killed somebody else by accident. Or the other people that had to wear these stones were people who'd killed a wolf. Um, now, this bemused us a bit, but she said um, the wolf is a very important animal for Svan people um, because there was a belief that the wolf was St. George in animal form. So St. George, the patron saint of Svaneti, can become a wild dog or a no. wolf. Yeah, or perhaps even a werewolf. No way. That's, that's mm -hmm. so cool. I had no idea that Svans held wolves in such 
sacred mm. ways because I've heard of that in other sort of indigenous cultures but I haven't heard this story mm-hmm. about St George becoming a werewolf that is just mm. well that's just wild and <laughs> also if you think about it the surname Chamgeliani has the word yeah. Mgeli in the middle which means wolf in Georgian yeah and I think that kind of might you know give a clue to the character of the family in a way <laughs> There's a point in our interview when we touch on Madonna and Madonna's character and her... Now, what is it that uh, Dawn said? Oh, her flashing eyes and her fiery spirit. While Anna Lee mentioned hearing a lot from Madonna about, what was it, the background of the songs and what she's been doing with her revolutionary activities. So, while we were in La Khushti, before the interview even, Madonna had um, been talking around the table about how she stood up to the Orthodox Georgian Church when they wanted to stop some of the ancient practices that the villagers had been taking part in at their local church. Now, this isn't the church right in the centre of the village. This is the church of Tangili. So Tangili Church stands hidden in the forest on the top of the hill, high above Lakushti. And the path, the way up there, it's not marked, it goes straight up through the meadows and it then enters into the forest. And Tangili is this tiny church consecrated to the, to the archangels. And inside it, it's decorated with amazing frescoes. And Madonna speaks a bit about those in our interview. Yeah, Madonna was saying that the frescoes inside are from the 13th century, but they're just the ones we can see. Underneath there are other layers, and they think they're probably back to the 9th century because that's the age of the building itself. And for Madonna... Tangili Church is a very special place. Um, There are layers and layers as to why it's special for her. Um, Every year there are two feast days and just the the very age of it being from the 9th century is special. So Tangili Church, it has its own special liturgical chant, sacred chant, and that it will be chanted during the feast days at Tangili. Oh yes, I think it's called Diadeb. I've seen a video on Facebook of the Australian group Tinskaro learning it from Givi Pirtskhalani, who's an elder in La Khushti and has been chanting at Tangiloba for the last 66 years. <laughs> And during the feast days, a group of men arrive and are standing inside the church and they are singing and praying. Um, and they start saying, Wodi Deba. And at the same time, every man says some prayers, some texts, but different texts, and then they all end at the same time in a synchronised way. And I love the way that Madonna explained the feeling of, of being at this feast day in Tangili, that she felt that if you went up at the beginning and you stayed all the way through to the end, that it was like the whole form was like the process of a song, how one is born and how it ends, because it starts from the traditions, from from the place, with the text, and then there are chants, and then they say the chant for the specific church, for Thangiri, and then people come out in the yard and they do seven round dances, so they're the Pakuli round dances, and everyone has to stand, the men, the women, and the children. Period. 
Now, this is when Madonna the Fighter comes in. So, a few years back, I think it was in around 2011, a group of orthodox people came to the village and the villagers helped them to build wooden houses up by Tangili Church. Um, and these were, were monks and they were living there. Um, and they waited, I don't know how long they were there, for months by the sounds of it. And they waited until Tangili Church feast day. And as usual, the villagers went up there. But these monks started to shout at them and to stop them and to say it wasn't right what they were doing, that they should not dance. And if they wanted to dance, they'd better go to a nightclub. And yeah, it was a, a shock. <laughs> And Madonna said she got she felt very nervous. She couldn't understand how it was possible that monks who were occupying the church and, and breaking the rules of the Lachushti visitors and trying to prohibit them from performing in our own in their own way. Um she was even saying that her sisters didn't agree with her. They were they couldn't understand why she was trying to fight and were saying that she would not succeed. So what does Madonna do? Well, she's um, an ethnologist she has a master's and she she wrote um, an article in an internet journal and she didn't just write about what was happening in Tangili but about the whole process that was taking place in Soneti and she said she she was not blaming she was just explaining and describing their own Svenetian traditions and how Svenetian people were very religious and explaining that this their, their way of of worshipping may have been a very old Christian tradition that they had preserved. So, yeah, after she wrote this article, apparently the whole contingent of the patriarchy started to fight against her. So she she learnt that even the patriarch, the head of the Georgian church, learnt about this article that she'd written. Um, and she said that she'd never met the patriarch before. But that wasn't entirely true, because she said, actually, he's my godfather. He baptised me in Lakushti church. So when all this story came out, and she was being attacked in this way, she responded by saying, well, I'm the patriarch's godchild and the patriarch welcomed me with an open heart. And uh, she was asked if, if there could be a meeting. So she wanted to go to this meeting to explain how important it was and explain the religion in Svaneti and, and why it was important to Svanetians. So this was a meeting in Tbilisi in the capital city at the head of the patriarchy, the head office, and she, she said she went along thinking there might be, I don't know, four or five people maximum, but when she went into the room there were about 50 priests and she was the only woman. <laughs> Well, the way Madonna tells the story, she explained everything, um, and the patriarch himself told the monks and the priests to let the people of Soleti do what they want and not to forbid them. And after that, the monks went away from Tengili. So, you see, Madonna really is a fighter. Uh, Although she says she, she doesn't like to fight unless it's necessary. So let's now hear the elders in Tawhili chanting Diadeb. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
And I can see that for Madonna, this fight was so necessary. The importance of Tangili Church had layers, and one of the layers was around her grandmother. So her grandmother, in the space of one month, had lost both her husband and her child. And of course she was in mourning and the whole village felt great pity for her. And just a few days after that tragedy, it was the feast day of Tangili. And her grandmother, of course, did not go up to the feast day in that year. But she realised, her grandmother realised, that there was no sound coming from Tangili because normally she'd be able to hear it in the village square. But this year, nobody was singing because everybody in the singing was in mourning together with her um, because of this, this terrible tragedy. <laughs> So her grandmother understood that she needed to go up to the church, up to Tangili, in her black clothes. And so she went up and she herself started to dance and to encourage other people to dance. And Madonna felt it was so important for her because if her grandmother had not done that dancing and that singing then the tradition that she was saving in 2011 may not have even been there then. They may have started a new tradition of, of there would always be someone in mourning and it may have continued like that and they may have lost that tradition at that point. And she felt, Madonna felt that life and death are two things that come together and it was very important for that to be continuing, that even when somebody is mourning the death of a person, that they should still be able to sing and dance during feast days. I got in this canada shell from Vigata and Gloveria, the Aritz Pepsim, the Rasta and Gary Sik. I Mandrokna, the Hashendra, and Proisaha. Yeah, and apparently her grandmother, whose name was Katie, um, people would say, if they were, if someone who's in mourning, they would say, Look at Katie, look what she has done. She started to sing and dance even though she was mourning her child and her husband. So you can do the same. And Madonna felt that this had started a, a new, a real tradition um, within the village. So the conversation and the interview became very poignant at this point because um, Madonna said that they themselves had experienced a similar sort of situation when their mother passed away because the very next day they had a concert in Israel and it was very difficult. And then Anna joins the conversation and said that actually her mother, their mother, had not been feeling well. And she'd said to them, if anything changes, keep going. If I couldn't teach you how to behave in that situation, I don't see the point of my life until now. seen the Cham Galliani sisters perform I've seen two sisters on mm -hmm. stage Anna and Madonna and sometimes their so-called adopted sister Levan <laughs> Bitarovi 
So I'm wondering where was the third sister, Eka? Ah, well, I asked her about this and basically she's busy being an educator um, in the kindergarten in Latali. Oh, and looking after seven cows and three bulls and many potato fields. Wow. So she has no time to travel and perform, so she says. Oh, OK. So I saw that the sisters will be performing in Belgium with Bassiani and Digori, which is quite a prestigious thing. So does that mean that Echo won't be joining them? <laughs> ah, well, Madonna says Eka is coming on the European tour in November. OK. But they were teasing each other quite a lot because they were very worried that the family might die of hunger. Oh, the rest of the family. Yeah, those left in Spinetti. <laughs> <laughs> to end this episode, let's hear from the actual interview with Zoe translating. What does Voices of the Ancestors mean to each of the sisters, starting with Anna? So, what does Voices of the Ancestors mean to you? It's <laughs> I personally don't even remember when I started to learn singing because it seems like uh, I, re- I was raised uh, in a singing environment. environment. I'm accompanied with the singers, I'm always with them. But now I have never met a person that he was always request, requesting us uh, to sing, uh, even if he was coming late at home, everywhere, every time he was like, yeah, let's sing. I was always happy to sing. And uh, he would then say, ah, you are my true child. <laughs> I had a baby, a chemi. I similar to baby, a zana, a patare, a baby, a bit, a rogar tights, 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 a rogar Rogori or I egara perian maxos, bro maxos hma. I had his seti harmonioli bibis. So actually, I do not remember really her personality or um, uh, visually how she looked, but what I remember the most is her voice. And now this is Eka. Uh, I remember that I was uh, at that time um, studying in the school, which is a few meters mm-hmm. away from our house, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was like in the first grade, and I remember because our mom was a teacher in that school, uh, and my grandmother was already um, ill, and uh, my, my I remember how my mother would ask me um, at each break, you know, between the classes, mm-hmm. uh, to. Uh, go home and check if my grandma was okay. And now Madonna. Uh, me, I didn't, uh, I, I never, I, I did not know my grandmother, but for me, the most important person connected to singing was, was my father. 
I was a late child uh, when um, when I, I when I was raised. Um, my sisters were already already um, students in Tbilisi, so I remember a special relationship uh, with my father. I I remember how he um, transmitted to, to me the whole information that he had. Uh, uh, so every evening he would tell me stories about everything here uh, so my sister, of course, remember my grandmother, but even though I do, did not uh, know her, I remember better uh, because of all these stories that would tell, that my father would tell me. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to Voices of the Ancestors with Holly Taylor Zuntz and Susan Thompson. Our guests were Anna, Madonna and Eka Changeliani with Zoe Perret translating, as well as Dawn Ellis and Anna Lee Wilson. Thank you, Gosha, for the Diadeb audio. Now, we're not academic musicologists, so we'll signpost you to some more thoroughly researched resources in the show notes, if that's your kind of thing and also some links to films about Svanetian folk music and a link to the European tour in November 2023. If you were interested to visit The Singing Village, you could go to the resources page of our website, voicesoftheancestors.co.uk, where you will find information about all the tours that we know of happening in Georgia. While you're on the website, you could support us by visiting our donate page. And you'll also find a transcript of this episode and all our episodes. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.